I can't believe I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our lead store today, Vanguard, is doing the unthinkable. And with more than 50 million investors who trust their money and financial future with this asset manager, they will be outright shocked and perhaps appalled to find out that Vanguard is doing something with their money that they wouldn't even do. Plus, one of our long-term sponsors, Shapeway Holdings, is back, and we're really excited because this 3D printing company is well-positioned as their industry is projected to grow by more than 20% per year. In fact, one analyst has a price target that is more than double the current trading price of their stock. We'll show you more about that later, plus the chart setup that we're gonna show you. If you wanna be buying where the big money is, we're gonna show you an incredible chart setup to bring your trading account up by more than 23%. You can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol SHPW. Check out the pinned comment or description below, or stay tuned to the end of the show for more information. Now let's head over to Bloomberg, where we picked today's story up with a headline, Vanguard piles into Europe periphery debt as rate cuts near. And this is staggering because most investors right now do not want to touch the debt markets at all. In fact, they're more concerned about the likeliness that interest rates could go higher here in choosing to be in short-term debt, CDs, and money market. But Vanguard, who manages one of the biggest bond funds in the world, is now targeting something their own clients wouldn't touch. Vanguard Asset Management, the world's second largest asset manager, and Canidrium, which oversees $152 billion of assets, are buying up more government bonds from the so-called periphery nations of Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And we've been warning that these countries could be in big trouble because where the German economy goes, and we know that it is funneling downward into an abyss led by their manufacturing sector, which remains deep in a depression will send the peripheral zone around the euro area all down with it. But yet, here we see Vanguard stepping in and buying bonds, something their own clients believe is a bad move. Not only are they uncertain if these countries will even be able to pay on their debt, the reality is many people believe, including the Fed, that interest rates are still going higher. And yet more than a decade on since their soaring yields threatened the future of the euro, the group is now viewed as far more fiscally sound. The question is, do you believe that? And a growing pool of investors are more comfortable holding their debt. So yet here we see other people and Vanguard following other investors in when the broad consensus is to avoid government debt at all costs. The question we should try to answer today is, is Vanguard right or wrong? And as inflation and rates have clearly turned a corner last year, we believe money should continue to flow in the European periphery, suggesting, as this from the head of international rates at Vanguard, that it's all about interest rates. And if interest rates go down, or at least the suggestion from central bankers that at some point rates will go down, the money will flood in here. But what the issue is, a lot of people still believe, and I see this in the comments, that inflation indeed is going back up and in a big way in the not too distant future, which would keep central bankers in play to keep rates much higher for a lot longer. And this month, Vanguard has been adding to their position started late last year and are now overweight in Spanish debt and has extended their position in Greece and picked up some Italian bonds. And for us, the head of fixed income at Canandrium has upgraded Italy and Portugal from to neutral from underweight, suggesting they're eagerly snapping up the debt from these countries that are mired in massive debt loads and weak economies. The only question is, what is the saving grace that Vanguard and other asset managers are hoping for? Well, they're hoping the ECB and other central bankers cut rates in a big way. And But if we're looking at just inflation, as we see here, the federal funds rate shown in blue against the consumer price index, we're going to look at the U.S. data here. And what do we note that even though we hear from central bankers around the world that they're fixated on inflation, 
oftentimes they're cutting rates well ahead of a peak of inflation, except this time we know that the Fed continues to hike and maintain a very high rate for the fund rate along with other central bankers around the world, despite the fact that inflation is coming down because the broad belief among many people, not just the central bankers, but investors all over the world, is that, in, that inflation is not only bottomed here in the short term, but it's going to go much higher, just like it did in the 70s. Is the case for that real? Well, as you're about to see, not very likely. A key sign of confidence in the periphery came last month, thus according to Vanguard, when markets calmly digested news that the ECB would be accelerating the end of its pandemic era bond buying program known as PEPP. In this case, with the fact is that if the ECB doesn't have to put support under the bond market, this is something that Vanguard and other asset managers look to see as a sign of confidence in the debt markets, and that's why they want a big piece of this, putting their clients' money, again, invested in something their own clients would not even think about doing. But is the payoff potential there? Well, the answer is absolutely, because government debt tends to be very sensitive to interest rates. And we know that, of course, even though the Fed and the ECB and other central banks are not really talking a whole lot about cuts, maybe later this year, if everything goes well, what we do know is the yield curve here we're showing in red. This is a 10-year minus a two-year. And any time it's underneath this horizontal black line, that means two-year yields are higher than 10-year. And that is an abnormal in the markets, only something created by central bankers in their attempt to retain inflation and bring it down. The issue here is banks don't lend when inflation or when the in yield curve is inverted as it is now. And what that does in the signals throughout history, these inversions mean the central bankers got it wrong and the likely path for interest rates is lower along with inflation, not higher as many believe. So this is a bet, not just on the economy, Economy and other buyers, but on central bankers. And sure enough, Vanguard and other asset managers could be right on this play as we look at the federal fund rate against the 10 year Treasury yield alone now. And what we can see is the bond market tends to lead central bankers down every single time the most of the bond market rotates well ahead of the first rate cut and then continues to fall driving central bankers to cut even further we can see now that the peak potentially in the 10 year is behind us suggesting the fed may be getting nervous here as the bond market starts to suggest that rates need to go lower, not higher. But the reality of the story here, is this about just central bankers cutting or is this about the global economy slowing? Let's take a look around the world because there's some big developments now going on in China. We have some new data out of the US and other parts of the world that suggest the global economy is slowing that will bring inflation down. And if that mattered enough to central bankers, well, if the economy starts to go, the labor market eventually follows and that means we know that rate cuts are in the near term future, not for later this year. As China itself leads to record 38 trillion gap within U.S. stocks, this is unheard of. And China offers value, but catalysts are just not there. This according to the chief investment officer at Foundation Asset Management. Meanwhile, the U.S. market has momentum, as we know, and the economy on its side, well, at least for now. In the growing divergence comes the steep losses paint a troubling picture of global investor sentiment towards the number two economy, making only the big case here is when will the opportunity be to be invested in Chinese equities? Well, you don't need to look too further. Check out the description below. We know our reports cover this in a big way. You've heard me talk about it on other shows. Grab one of those free month trials while you can. There's only three. How about this? The Wilshire 5000 against advanced retail sales. Why does the equity markets matter so much here? Because where the equity markets go, retail sales follow and this is something as we look to China why are they likely to stimulate their economy and try to bring their equity markets up because they know when the wealth effect evaporates well so too do sales and demand and that's already an issue they have now here we can see in the U.S. when the Wilshire 5000 goes down well it tends to bring retail sales down with it here we can see again going into the global financial crisis look at post-pandemic you know the stock market's rallying people are getting money from 
from the government. They feel wealthy, and that drives retail sales just to the moon. And now we're seeing a rebound in them. Hopefully, as many people are believing, is being led by the confidence that the U.S. equity market is leading the economy out of what we now are beginning to think. Again, not me, but the consensus that we have achieved the mythical soft landing. And yet investors have been underwhelmed by Beijing's efforts to revive the economy struggling with deflation and an ongoing property crisis. What began as a performance-driven exodus now risks becoming a structural shift due to doubts over Beijing's long-term economic and strategic competition with the U.S. This is a huge problem because what is going on in China is actually much worse than the mainstream media wants to tell us, much worse than even Beijing's responding to, which is somewhat shocking that they're not doing more here because the issue is if their markets continue to crater, they're going to lose confidence even more so by their own consumers who are turning their backs on the property market. They're going to spend less in the real economy. And next thing you know, China is going to have to do what we'll say is the unthinkable, and that is coming soon. As China's bold stock market rescue plan now leaves investors skeptical, suggesting that the big second largest economy is still headed down. And if that's the case, that means interest rates will go down with it, putting Vanguard perhaps in a position, taking a risk that their own clients wouldn't even do to have a massive potential payoff. As Xi Jinping's people are almost certainly telling them that the route in the equity market is a stability risk, and it absolutely is, because when people lose money and their value of their net worth goes down, they spend less. They start getting even more conservative. They cut back their risk. They pay off their debts. And in debt-based systems, this is the key part to leading to a deflationary spiral that starts to unwind all kinds of risks and in capital markets and the banking system. It just starts to snowball all over the place. So this is a structural issue here. Investors aren't just abandoning Chinese stocks for normal reasons of valuation, because if they weren't, well, it would be a great buying opportunity. We'll just say not yet. But because the whole economic policy and political environment has atrophied, getting confidence back probably requires major changes in both. It would also make a big difference the global economy started to rebound. And the latest package includes about 2 trillion yuan to buy mainland shares. Get this, Beijing coming in and supporting the stock market via offshore trading links show a sense of urgency from authorities. It comes after a route that's seen Chinese and Hong Kong stocks erase more than 6 trillion in market value since the peak reached in 2021. The value of China's equity market has never been the, that far behind the U.S. Again, suggesting if there is a bottom at some point, this is going to be a fantastic investment vehicle for investors to rotate into. But in the short term, will this work? Will it have any effect? The answer is highly unlikely because China, remember, they're the world's largest exporter. They're subject to the whims of the global economy, mainly the United States. If demand here goes down, well, demand there goes down. Even worse, they do have a huge population that could drive a lot of domestic consumption. The problem is they're going to work. They're seeing demand going down. They're seeing new orders drop. They're seeing backlogs go away. And now they're seeing the stock market go down on top of the fact that the real estate market is mired with a bunch of insolvent developers that are tied to a bunch of banks that are insolvent. If you were a Chinese consumer, you wouldn't want to be buying stocks or, or spending money either. And the 2015 experience shows that even when the government steps up buying, the rally is not necessarily sustainable unless we have a bigger stimulus package to address the economic issues, suggesting that what Beijing is doing now is going to fail. And so we look around the economy, we look for signs to see that our central bankers likely to cut. Well, we can make the case that China is one of them. But how about here in the U.S.? Are there some signs that the economy here is indeed slowing and that maybe Vanguard taking a huge risk? risk on buying debt from countries who don't have any chance of repaying any of it will work well maybe as oil drops as global supplies counter mounting mid-east tensions many people believe oil was headed to the moon as of course opec was cutting supply we said it's all about economic conditions and sure enough here we can see it's happening as crude has struggled to set a clear direction this year despite the geopolitical tensions and a pledge by opec to rein in production Oil's gains have been dampened by indications of abundant non-OPEC output with the IEA forecasting ample supply. And why would we have ample supply? Very one single reason why? 
That means demand is coming down in a big way. And how does that come back to the U.S. equity markets? Well, we can note that where oil goes in terms of demand, eventually the stock market falls. Now, oil does not always lead the equity market lower. We can see it did here in the dot-com bubble coming down and suggesting that the stock market was going the wrong way and needed to play catch-up. We know the stock market went down in the global financial crisis, bringing yanking the floor out from underneath oil. But how about going into the global slowdown between 2014 and 2016, oil came down. Usually that should be an economic boost and it wasn't the stock market went flat. We know there was a divergence here going into the pandemic as everyone believed that lower rates and lower oil was gonna to lead to a boom. Well, that didn't matter because the pandemic happened. Today, we see the same divergence. The equity market saying, no, we got this. Oil market saying, look, I don't know what you got, but demand is going down. And as we look into the US manufacturing sector, we have some recent surveys now from the regional Fed that tells us things here are not getting better, they're getting worse. In fact, this is highly even more correlated than what you see of the Fed's moves towards inflation. As we look to the fifth district here of this being Richmond, the manufacturing activity remains sluggish in January. Doesn't sound like a soft landing, according to the Federal Reserve. The composite manufacturing index decreased from minus 11 to minus 15 in January. And of its three component indexes, shipments edged up a little bit, but remained in contraction. New orders edged down, also in contraction. And employment fell from minus one to minus 15. We said this, when those backlogs get worked out when new orders don't come the uh, people will hit the unemployment line others that stay will get raises but at the cost of some of their other workers firms remain somewhat pessimistic about local business conditions as the index increased slightly but remained in negative territory and how about we move on because most firms continue to report declining backlogs here in richmond as the index remained negative the vendor lead time even decreased capacity utilization fell and about one third of response reported decline in capacity utilization since december suggesting things are not getting better but how about we look at the philly fed because well what's going wrong in richmond also is happening in Philly as manufacturing activity in the region continued to decline overall. This according to the January Business Outlook Survey. The indicators for general activity, new orders and shipments rose, they all remain negative. So they got slightly better, but remained in contraction. The employment index was little changed and continues to suggest mostly steady levels of employment. The price indicate indexes indicate overall increases in prices, but both indices are below their long run averages, suggesting that indeed inflation and interest rates remain too high and are likely to come down. And if that is the case, as we know that where the bond market goes, the Fed eventually follows. But how does this matter to the bond? How does the manufacturing sector matter to the Fed? Well, it matters in a big way, which is setting up Vanguard to be very possibly right about their trade. Here you can see the current general activity index in blue against the federal fund rate. And what we can note is that as the Philly Fed goes down, this again from the Philadelphia Fed, what we can see is manufacturing activity contracts. The Fed responds accordingly each and almost every time. Well, except this time, the Fed says that is necessary to bring inflation down in a big way. But what does it mean now if we start looking at crude oil? Is there a connection to that in the federal funds rate? Well, not every time but tends to be we see as crude oil goes down we see demand decline well that means inflation comes down the fed starts to cut here we see going into the 1990s recession we see it happen in going into the dot-com bubble now this is a case where crude oil prices rallied as you see in blue against the declining funds rate and then it came crashing down same effect here oil is suggesting economic slowdown going into the pandemic and now it is again and yet the fed maintains convincingly that of course they know what's best for the economy as they look now toward the equity markets but even that as we can note with the federal funds rate suggests that pain will eventually come when the fed starts to cut because the equity markets can indeed rally when the fed plateaus but hang tight if the fed starts to cut even most investors believe it's bullish historically it is not bullish at all in this case we see a potential fed cut suggesting that the, the time for the broad equity markets is not going to last a whole lot longer but there are sectors that tend to do very well those are growth sectors 
even in an economic slowdown, we can see that companies are gonna reach out to on-demand 3D printing companies like our sponsor, Shapeways. You can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol SHPW. Let's take a look at what's going on with this company because we think big things are coming along with big moves from their stock price. Everything in the description and pinned comment below because what they do is they offer a 3D printing service for you to create, customize, streamline, and more importantly, save. They break down barriers and scale your business with their services. Let's take a look here because this sector is poised to grow. This is from Grandview Research that says the global 3D printing market size was valued at 20.37 billion last year as expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 23.3% over the next seven years. That would put companies like Shapeways in a huge position to take advantage of that growth, not to mention that we think their stock market is at a deep value point right now. I'm gonna show you where the big money is buying and how you can buy it at the same place they are. Just first look at this, we have an analyst forecast. This was put back at a target of $4. Shapeways is trained right around $2 a share, suggesting a potential 100% move in their stock price in the future. That would be huge for most people, let's trading accounts in a big way. Let's take a look at their stock price here because you notice here we have the supply zones written, drawn in, and this is a place when you see a supply zone is where buyers are at. So you notice down here when it gets between these two purple lines, you see price falls, buyers step in. Price fall, buyers step in. And again, and again, and again. And what you see comes out of that is once all the sellers are exhausted, what do you notice? Price shoots back up. Price shoots up, price shoots up. Here we see it again on the cusp of price rallying here. This would be a 23% move up into the next zone where sellers have been. But let's look at the short term. You wanna be buying this stock where the other big players are? Well, again, check them out on the NASDAQ under the symbol SHPW. Here's that volume profile line in red. That means over the last 90 days, this is where all the buyers have been accumulating shares and you too can join them on that initial move up to 23% here as we look to target that higher supply zone where the sellers are at, break through that zone and the stock can go even a whole lot higher than that. Again, you can find Shapeways on the NASDAQ under the symbol SHPW. And as always, with any company we feature on our show, you're under no obligation to purchase their stock. Be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.